We finished off last week looking at this verse. So uh, Esther 6, 6, it says, So H Haman came in, and the king said to him, What is to be done for the man whom the king desires to honour? And Haman said to himself, Whom would the king desire to honour more than me? Then Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king desires to honour, let them bring a royal robe which the king has worn, and the horse on which the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal crown has been placed. Let the robe and the horse be handed over to the one of, of the king's most noble princes, and let them array the man whom the king desires to honour, and lead him on horseback through the city square, and proclaim before him, Thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honour. It's very interesting, actually, what Haman says here, because if you think about it logically, Haman is already the prime minister. He's already got an incredible amount of power. So what is he trying to gain out of this? Well, what, he, what, what he's trying to gain out of this is he wants to wear the king's clothes. He wants the king's robe, he wants the king's horse, and he wants the king's crown. And so this is a very political thing that he's doing, and it's moving him one step further to be not just the prime minister, but the king. So where does this spirit come from? Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. This goes all the way back to the heart of Lucifer. And these are things that are beyond our comprehension. Let's be honest, we can't fully comprehend how in perfection Lucifer would even think these things. But it tells us in Ezekiel 28 that it was found in his heart. So it says, how you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn, Lucifer. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. So it, this, is, this speaks of the king of Babylon, it speaks of Lucifer, and it speaks of the Antichrist. But you said in your heart, now we have this whole series of eyes here, don't we? I will, I will, I will, I will ascend to the heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars. What does Haman say? Who's he going to um, exalt apart from me? And th this is what I want. I want his crown. I want his robes. I want his horse. And I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. You see that? Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. To those who see you will gaze at you, and they will ponder over you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness? Is this him? He, he, there'll come a day when this being will look pathetic. Right now, the world is terrified of this being. And we see so, so many people that have been motivated by him, by Lucifer. And right now we see things going on around the world. There's a fear, isn't there? There's such a terrible, terrible fear. And if you're anything like me, you are digging in and you're praying to the Lord right now. That the Lord will show you and give you such a peace in these times. Because Christians need a peace. And that's what I'm hoping that we'll get this morning. We'll get a peace. Now, Lucifer didn't just want to be like the Most High. He wanted more than that. If you, if you have a look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. And so did Haman. Haman didn't just want to be the, uh, like the king. They always want more. So Matthew 4, verse 10. And Jesus... Um, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go, Satan. 
For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Notice what Satan wants. He doesn't just want to be like God. He wants God to worship him. It's incredible, the audacity of this thing. Now that's really important. When, it, when Jesus replies, you shall worship the Lord, who is the Lord? Jesus is the Lord. <laughs> Jesus is the Lord. That's what his name means. Yahweh is salvation. You shall worship the Lord. One more scripture, and this helps us to understand kind of what's going on today a bit. 2 Thessalonians 2.4, this is what it says. It's talking about the Antichrist to come, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So when you see these people begin to arise, whether it be Hitler, whether it be Stalin, whether it be Haman, whoever it happens to be, they never want to be equal. They always want to be the very top. Ultimately, they want to be worshipped. They, they sang carols about Adolf Hitler. Did you know that? The Nazis made up carols about Hitler as being the Messiah. It's always, always the same. So... The, the, Haman is playing this political game and you know if you just give me a robe you know if you just give me a crown if you just give me a horse you know this gullible king has no idea what kind of uh, uh, game Haman's playing but go back to um, Esther 6 verse 10 we'll look at then the king said to Haman take quickly the robes and the horse as you have said and do for Mordecai, the Jew, who is sitting at the king's gate, do not fall short in anything of all that you have said. So, uh, you know, look, folks, it's hard to know what went on in, in Haman's heart when he heard that name Mordecai. <laughs> but I can guarantee you his heart just dropped like a stone. Um, and Jesus actually talks about this in, in the Gospels, you know, don't ever take the, 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 the most important seat. Kind of sit at the back and let other people promote you and so on. He talks about all those things. But here this man is so certain that it's him, only to find out that it's Mordecai. Now, this king doesn't have a lot of discernment. We can see that. But when he realises the goodness and faithfulness of Mordecai, he begins to sort of understand what's going on a little bit. It takes him a while. So Haman took the robe and the horse and arrayed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, thus it shall be done to the man whom the king desires to honour. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried home mourning with his head covered. Now we, we, can't, we can't not turn at this moment to Philippians 2. Philippians 2.2. 2. Let's just try and understand what's going on here in a, in a more fuller sense. In Philippians 2.2 2 it says this, Do nothing from selfish or empty ambition or empty conceit. Don't do anything through selfish ambition. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, <laughs> amazing, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. How on earth does God humble himself? How does Christ humble himself? What have they got to be humble of? He humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, the prince of life, Something that is impossible. How can, he, how can the eternal one die? 
by being obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And then look, look what happens. For this reason, for this reason, who's going to be exalted at the end of all this? For this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under. I love it when you see the wise men. And we don't know how many there were. We think there was three, but there could have been a lot more than three. But the wise men came and worshipped the baby. They bowed before him. Even as a baby, even before he'd done anything, they bowed before him. Marvellous that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is so precious to the Father. So can you see, and I'm, you know, we're all at a different stage in our Christian walk here, but there's more going on in Esther here than simply this. There's, there's actually something very important. But if you go back to Esther chapter 6, verse 13, it says, Haman recounted to Zeresh, his wife, and all of his friends, everything that had happened to him. Then his wise men and Zeresh, his wife, said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish origin, you will surely not overcome him, but it will sure, you will surely fall before him. Now, why on earth didn't she say this before? It's incredible. It seems like her advice is completely changed. Well, what is she basing this on? I mean, this is some statement. If he's of Jewish origin, you will fall before him. Well, this, this, it's simple. They're based on it on recent history. You look at Daniel. You look at the book of Daniel. You look at Daniel and his three friends. You look at King Nebuchadnezzar and how he was totally taken back by these, these young men. And of course, um, King Nebuchadnezzar, at the end of his life, actually writes his own testimony down in the book of Daniel that the God of Daniel is the God above all gods. It's incredible. And also, where we are right now, as we look right now, friends, we look at what's going on around the world, it's very, very worrying. I think for every person that understands patterns and cycles, it's very worrying. Anti-Semitism is rising unbelievably around this planet at this moment in time. But you've only got to go back 80 years when it looked like the Nazi part, they, they were planning for a thousand year reign. They really were. I mean, the decisions that they made, they were planning to stay in power for a very, very, very long period of time. And they were planning on liquidating this entire planet of every single living Jew. And in their destructive plans, they themselves were destroyed. And when you look at the way the leaders of the Nazi party took their own lives, so many of them, after all they did to other people, ended up being such cowards. Such cowards, after all that they'd done. And I've thought this many a times, if you were a, a Jewish person on the way to one of the death camps, and somebody had come from the future and said to you, within four years' time, You'll have your own nation back. You're, you will be reborn. You would never in a million years would you believe that. But it happened, you see. So from their point of view, it had happened. And from our point of view, it has happened. And how, when you look at the moment, you see the things that are happening. There's, there's only ever one outcome when anybody tries to rid the Jewish people off this planet. There's only one outcome. And that's not to say that the Jewish people are, they live a better life, they're more righteous or any of those things, because they're not. But God has a plan for them. 
we'll see this when we, when we get closer to Christmas. We'll look at King Ahaz and why King Ahaz survived. And the sign that was given to King Ahaz was that a virgin will be with child, you see. So it says here um, in verse 14, while they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hastily brought Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. I, me I mentioned this midweek. I, I, I woke up, um, I think it was Thursday morning. I actually woke up thinking about Daniel chapter 2. And Ray, Ray's actually wrote a song about this that talks about that it's God that changes the seasons, you see. And it's God that puts kings in place and disposes kings. It's God that does it. Well, that should fill us with such a sense of peace. Because if it's God that does it, do you really think he doesn't care for us? That he's going to bring his beloved people through this. If it's God that does it, then God will look after his people. And it may be that we, that we go through persecution. But even in that persecution, he's promised us, hasn't he? He's promised us. And one of the things that struck me in just looking at Daniel 2 again this week, that really I, I don't think I've ever seen before, it's never hit me before, is that all people are going to be susceptible to change. It's not just the Jewish people or the church. All people on this earth, even, even those that are the vehicles of change, will be susceptible to change. Everybody is going to go through change. Everyone. Nebuchadnezzar had to go through tremendous change and, and he had to come to the conclusion after he had a spout of going mad that actually the, the God of Daniel truly, the God of the, the Jewish people truly is God. All people are going to have to go through change. Please comfort yourself in that. It's not just what this group or that group, it's everyone. What's coming is it's going to change the world forever. Chapter 7. Now the, now the king and Haman came to drink wine with Esther the queen. I'm sure at this point Haman's thinking, this is just not going my way. And the king said to Esther on the second day, also as they drank their wine at the banquet, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. What is your request? Even to half of the kingdom, it shall be done. Then Queen Esther replied, If I have found favour in your sight, O king, if it pleases the king, now here she finally does it. She's waited. She's waited, she's fasted, she's prayed, and she's waited for this moment. And now she actually gives the petition. If I have found favour in your sight, now please... Please, comfort yourself in this. When you look at Joseph, he found favour. When you look at Daniel, he finds favour. When you look at Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they find favour. Nehemiah, he finds favour. Don't think, because the world is changing, and it is changing, things aren't good, that we're not going to have favour with unbelievers. Because I believe we will. If, if, if we remain faithful to the Lord, there will be favour. And in that favour, at some point, there, there, there will come a testing. But we will have favour if we remain faithful to our king. If I have found favour in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given to me as my petition and my people as my request. Esther's revealing to the king here, I'm Jewish. I'm Jewish. That edict that you signed to wipe out every single Jewish person, I am one of those. Only now does the king begin to realise that he's been played by this politician. 
For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. You see how strong this language is? Now, if we had only been sold as slaves, men and women, I would have remained silent. For the trouble would not be commensurate with the annoyance to the king. Then King Xerxes asked Esther, who is he? Where is he? Who would presume to do this? You see, friends, this king begins with zero discernment. He's played. So many politicians are being played today. They're, they're signing things away that they have no idea. You know, if we carry on on this trajectory, it's not going to go to a good place. They don't know really what's happening. What happens with this king is that he has a sleepless night and the first ray of hope is he realises there's a man called Mordecai that's been good to him, that he forgot about. It's only when he realises how good Mordecai is that he begins to thaw and understand, actually, this man that I've promoted to be the prime minister is the real problem. It takes time. Some people just can't see it until it directly affects them. And when it directly affects them, they change their mind. They can look at the, the Jewish people and think, you know, whatever. But when it affects them, that's different. And Esther said, a foe, an enemy, is this wicked Haman. Then Haman became terrified before the king and the queen. Then the king arose in his anger from drinking wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed. Notice he didn't go after the king here. No, Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm had been determined against him by the king. Now when the king returned from the palace garden into the place where they were drinking wine, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, will he even assault the queen with me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbiner and one of the eunuchs who were before the king said, Behold indeed, behold indeed, the gallows standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai. The king didn't even know that, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king. And the king said, hang him on it. Hang him on it. And this now is probably the most important, doctrinally, the most important part of this in, entire chapter. So they hanged Haman on the gallows and... It was more of a spike. They hanged Haman on the gallows, 50 cubits high. That is some high. I mean, that's incredible. They, that, that would be seen from a long, long way around. They hanged Haman on the gallows, which he had prepared for Mordecai. Listen, listen very carefully. And the king's anger subsided. That's the most important part. And the king's anger subsided. Esther is beautifully written, isn't it? It's beautifully put together. And it doesn't matter who reads Esther or how young or how old you are. Everything leads to this point. You can't wait for this to happen. You're longing to see this happen at some point. And there's this kind of deep satisfaction that justice has been done. And it's been written and designed that way that when you get to this verse here, verse 10, there's just this deep satisfaction. Justice has been done. 
Now, what we see here is a kind of a description of a word in the New Testament written in the English is the word propitiation. Propitiation, a deep satisfaction that justice has been done. And when we begin to understand propitiation, we begin to really understand the cross. And when we begin to understand the cross, we begin to understand why our faith is so completely different than any other faith at all. And yet our faith is only the culmination of everything that's written in the Old Testament. So we're going to look at it. We're going to look at this. We're going to whiz through this. Just turn to Jonah. Jonah chapter 1 verse 11. Jonah 1 verse 11. So they said to him, what should be done to you that the sea may become calm for us? Jonah's ran away. Jonah is the problem, isn't he? Jonah's the problem. He's disobedient. He's gone in the wrong direction. He's gone down, he's gone down, and he's gone down. And these sailors are saying, what must we do to get the sea to stop raging? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. And Jonah, he said to them, Jonah said, pick me up and throw me into the sea. And then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Then they called on the Lord and said earnestly, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not put innocent blood on us. For you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah and they threw him into the sea and the sea stopped its raging. As soon as Haman was put upon the stake, the king's anger subsided. As soon as Jonah is thrown overboard, Jonah is the problem, Jonah is the issue. When he's thrown overboard, the sea stops raging. What is going on here? Hey friends, what is justice? What actually is justice? What is righteousness? In this world that we live in today where people hardly understand justice anymore, they hardly understand righteousness anymore, what is it? What does it look like? When we get to that point in Esther, there's a sense in which finally the right thing has been done. This man deserved what he got. Jonah's thrown overboard, the sea is appeased. What is justice and what is righteousness? Have a quick look at the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4. Oh, I, I, this is just beautiful. I love Deuteronomy. Jesus quotes more from Deuteronomy, you know. He fights Satan with the book of Deuteronomy. It is written. It's all from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 32 verse 1, give ear O heavens and let me speak, let the earth hear the words of my mouth, let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as the droplets on the fresh grass and as the showers on the herb, for I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock, his work is perfect and all his ways are what? His ways are just. He is a God of faithfulness and without injustice. His ways are just. What God does is what is right. There's nothing unjust in him. He is righteous and upright. What does justice look like? What does it look like? And what is it going to look like when all this has come to a completion? Psalm 97 Psalm 97, verse 2. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Smile, Jesus loves you. He does. 
He does love us, it's so true. That little smiley sticker that we used to have many moons ago, it is true, Jesus does love us. But Jesus is also just, and he is righteous. God is just. Yes, God is love, but he is just, and he is righteous. And it tells us, it tells us here that his righteousness and his justice are the foundation of his throne. Isn't that amazing? The foundation of his throne. Psalm 9 verse 8. From Psalm 9 verse 8. It says, And he will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for all peoples with equity. So not only is God just, not only is he righteous, He's going to judge the entire world by his standards. By his standards. You you see where this is going, friends? (laughs) In the light of the things that are going on today, where evil is being proclaimed as good, and good is being proclaimed as evil. But God is going to judge the world by his standards. Leviticus chapter 5 Leviticus chapter 5, verse 17. Now, if a person sins and does any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done, though he was unaware, he still he is guilty and shall bear his punishment. You see, it tells us in Romans that we're without excuse. That God has placed eternity into the heart of man. And that all people, whether they've read the Bible or not, have something of a moral compass inside of them. They all know. It's there. We've been made in the image of God. And so all of us, whether we've read much of the word or not, will have to stand before a righteous God who will judge, who will judge according to his righteousness. Not ours. Solomon, in his backslidden state, um, talks about this in Ecclesiastes. In the book of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 7, verse 20. Indeed, he says, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good, and who never sins. Well, (laughs) here's the thing. Now, for every Christian, we, we understand this back to front. We get it. But, friends, there's an entire world out there that the gospel is so alien to them, they just don't get this at all. So if... If God is going to judge the world, the whole world, by his own standards, and if the Bible clearly teaches that there's not a righteous man on earth that continually does good who never sins, then we have a problem, don't we? We have a problem. In in Psalm 14, verse 1, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's one of the ways of dealing with this, you see. One of the ways of dealing with a God that's going to judge in righteousness is just say, well, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there is anyone who understands, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. No, not even one. In fact, he says in Isaiah that our righteousness is as filthy rags. And it's an, a very, very insulting term, of course. And so in, in the Gospel of Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus talks about this issue. He said to them, You are those who justify yourselves. In the sight of men. You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men. But God knows your hearts. 
for that which is highly esteemed among men, it actually says is an abomination in the sight of God. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. So we, we have this age that we live in where everybody is justifying their actions. We've got to that point now where evil is defined as good and good is defined as evil and the alarm bells are going off in our mind and we don't know what to do. But here's the thing. Shall not the God of the whole earth do what's right? Yes, he will. What will he judge people by? He will judge people by his standards, no, no, nobody else's. Psalm 51, King David, bless him. He puts it like this in Psalm 51, verse 5. David says, behold, he committed adultery. He made a real mess. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin, my mother conceived me. Even David admits, there's no hope for me. I'm a sinner. I am susceptible to sin from the day I was born. In 1 Timothy, I know we're racing through them this morning, friends. <laughs> In 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, this is what Paul says. It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So now this picture builds even more. So we know that God is just. We know that he's going to judge people by his own standards. We also know that there's no one on this planet that hasn't sinned. But now we read that Christ has actually come to this world to save sinners. To save sinners. Among whom, Paul says, I am foremost of all. So we begin to see this this pattern build up in the word of God. Now have a, have a look at Romans. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. There's a price, there's a wage for all that. For the wages of sin is death. Shall not the God of the whole earth do what's right? Now, we see this with Adam. On the day that you eat, on the day that you eat, you will surely die. Well, a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. Adam did not make a thousand years, he died within that day. He died within that day. The wages of sin truly is death, and that can never be annulled. Do you understand? God cannot go back on his word. The wages of sin is death and it cannot be annulled. But then he goes further, he says, yes, the wages of sin is death. And death ultimately is separation from God eternally. Yes, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we begin to build up this picture. Have a little look at the Gospel of John. Beautiful, really beautiful. And we're going to kind of get to the point of this very shortly. In the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 14. Jesus is talking to the rabbi of Israel. The great teacher. The great teacher. And I want to say this, friends. I, I've, I've known through my time... Some theologians, um, some people that have got doctorates and things and been quite close to some of them. Do you know what I find uh, sometimes happens when you start to get so deep into theology is that people begin to think that they've outgrown the gospel. It's amazing. But they think that the gospel is below them. That it's some kind of thing that somehow they've outgrown and it's just not interesting to them. So they, they understand all of the kind, kind of sideshows and side issues and, you know, they strain after a gnat and swallow a camel and stuff. But unless you understand the gospel in Christianity, none of the other stuff matters. None of it. So he says to Nicodemus, are you the teacher of Israel and you do not understand these things? You don't understand what the very DNA of Christianity is. 
The DNA of Christianity is that God is just. God is righteous. God will judge the whole world by his standards. The whole world has sinned. There's nobody that hasn't sinned. So Christ sent his only son. That's the gospel. Let's go on. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen. You do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe them, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who's descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Here we are. Here's the thing. This is an incredible verse. As Moses was lifted up, Sorry, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And then we get the most famous verse in the entire Bible off the back of this very strange verse. Of the back of a very strange verse where Moses takes a snake and a snake always speaks of Satan, always speaks of the devil, where the snake is lifted up in the wilderness and those that looked to this snake were healed. He says, just as that happened back then, so in the very same way, the Son of Man himself will be lifted up like the snake in the wilderness, that whosoever believes on him shall have eternal life. Do you understand where we're going with this? When Haman was lifted up, the king's wrath was appeased. When Haman was lifted up, what was Haman? He was a horrible, vile, wicked man. And when we saw Haman lifted up, there's a sense in all of us of which finally justice has been done. Do you understand? Finally justice has been done. Haman deserves to be lifted up. He deserves to die that kind of horrible death because of who he is. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. That's the word propitiation. That's what it means. That, that, that anger towards sin has been appeased. So this is what it says in Isaiah chapter 53. In Isaiah 53, verse 6, it says this. All of us like sheep have gone astray. All of us. Each of us, individually now, so the, collectively now individually, each of us has turned to our own way. I preached on this at a funeral a few weeks ago. You know, folks, that's what we, everybody's turned to their own way. The, 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 the favorite song that people want at their funeral today is, I did it my way. And they, th they actually think it's funny. To go, I mean, they're already there by that point when the song's been sung anyway. They're already in that place. Oh, God. But all of us, like sheep, have gone astray, collectively. But individually, each of us has turned to his own way. But look at, look at God's remedy. Look at his remedy. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Jesus said... Just as the serpent is lifted up, that sinful serpent is lifted up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And those that believe on him will be saved. What does it say here? All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. But this is Christianity. You know, here we are at this time of year. This is Christianity. This is what separates us from everything else. Every other religion is people trying to somehow reach heaven. Christianity is God stepping out of heaven and coming down to us and saying, you've truly blown it. And if you had a thousand lives and a thousand attempts, you'd blow it every single time. So I'm stepping out and I will lay upon my son 
that horrible, twisted, sick, sin nature. Just as the serpent is lifted up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Absalom wanted David's throne. That's all he wanted is David's throne. He was a very handsome man with long locks of hair and he he really thought he was something. And he's after him. He's hunting David down. He wants his throne. And in his pursuit of David's throne, he hangs himself by his hair and he, he, he dies. But David mourns Absalom's death. And David said, Absalom, Absalom, if it was just me, I wish I could have died in your place. That was David. Even though his son wanted his throne, David's heart for, 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 for Absalom was, if, I'd have t- if I could have taken your punishment, I would have. I wish it was me. The same thing happens with Moses when the children of Israel are disobeying. And Moses says, blot me out, Lord. Blot me out of the book of life that you, that you would forgive them. Blot me out. That was Moses' heart. Paul has the same heart towards the Jewish people. He says, I could wish that I could be accursed in order for Israel to be saved. Do you understand that the heart of David, the heart of Moses, the heart of Paul, the heart was right, but they were not worthy. Do you understand? The heart was right, but they were not worthy. Why were they not worthy? Because they were sinful men. Who is worthy, Revelation chapter 5? The word axios. Who can be weighed against God? Who can take our place for us apart from God? Who can be just but also be the justifier of our sin? Who can go there? Can David? No. Can Moses? No. Can Paul? Absolutely not. There is only one that qualifies that could have gone and taken our place. And that is God in flesh. There is nobody else. And this is what we see. This is why you have to understand when Haman was up on that pole writhing, the king's anger was subsided. God is angry towards sin. It offends him. Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Peter tells us that he bore our sin in his own body just as the serpent is lifted up in the wilderness. So must the son of man be lifted up. That sin-sick serpent nature was put within Christ upon the cross and judged, judged. Suspended between heaven and earth on the scaffold, pierced for our transgressions. This is the gospel. This, there's nothing, friends, there's nothing like this anywhere else in the whole of the world. There is nothing like this. And one day they will look upon him whom they have pierced. Who are they going to look upon? Who they have pierced? Well, actually, they think it's God. Well, it is God. It is God. They shall look upon him. They shall look upon me, it says, whom they have pierced. Whom they have pierced. 2 Corinthians 5.21, one of the most incredible verses in the entire Bible. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Oh, yeah. He, he made him, who? He, God the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin. He knew no sin. Jesus was as innocent upon the cross as the day he was born. The man never gave way to any sin whatsoever. It's very hard for us to understand. But in the Gospels he says, Satan has nothing on me. Who can accuse me of sin? He has nothing on me. He that knew no sin became sin. Became sin. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we, now this is the thing, this is it, this is it, so that we might become the what? The righteousness of God in him. 
What is God? He's righteous. What is it that we feel when Haman is up on that scaffold? We feel justice has been done. Justice has been done. That's what God the Father felt when his son was placed upon that cross and that horrible, sin-sick, selfish, ambitious, political, vile, sexually immoral, fornicating, torturous, idolatrous nature was in him, placed in him. Justice has finally been done. Listen. In the Second World War, not everybody made the draft. Not everybody could go to the front line to fight. There were all sorts of things that would disqualify you from being on that front line. And unless you made the grade, you couldn't go and fight. Do you understand? It was in David's heart. I wish I could be in Absalom's place. You can't, David. You're disqualified. You can't go to the front line. Moses, I wish I, I could be blotted out of the book of life so that they had, you can't, Moses, you're a sinner. Paul, I wish I could be damned that they would be saved. You can't. You can't be drafted into this. Nobody could be drafted into this apart from God in flesh. That's the great sign that was given to Ahaz. A virgin shall be with child and you shall call him Emmanuel, which is... God is with us. So many people would like to, but they can't be drafted in. Nobody could be drafted in. There was no plan B. There was no, well, if Jesus doesn't make this, well, we'll you know, there's no plan B. There was no safety net. Either Christ did this or he didn't. So when Christ roars like the lion of the tribe of Judah upon the cross, it is finished. Paid in full, folks. It was the only one that could do it. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Romans 3, verse 23. This is the gospel. Romans 3, verse 23. For all have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. This is what the Bible tells us. There are many, many world religions that say if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then whatever God that is that's going to kind of just... But how? there's no way of knowing. Yeah, I feel so sorry for people that believe that. How are you ever going to know whether your good deeds outweigh your bad anyway? There's no way of knowing. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There it is. Well, in a way, some people find this to be an insult. I find this to be a relief. At least you know where you stand. I know where I stand. I'm a sinner. And I've fallen way short. So what's the answer? Show me the answer, Lord, because you've shown me my predicament. And I know I'm a sinner anyway, because the Holy Spirit has shown me. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ, whom God displayed publicly, publicly as a propitiation, as a propitiation. Do you understand? When Haman was displayed publicly, that horrible, conniving rat of a man was displayed publicly. The king's anger Disappeared. That's what the word propitiation means. It's the point when God's anger towards sin is appeased. It's appeased. It's Jonah being thrown overboard. They were asking for a sign. Give us a sign. Give us a sign. He says, the only sign I will give you is the sign of Jonah. Jonah is a type of Jesus. He was thrown overboard. And for three days and three nights, he was in the belly of the whale. You know what happens. He's effectively resurrected after three days and three nights. Christ, if you like, was thrown overboard by the Father into this world, was born in poverty, was raised in an occupied place, had every reason to complain. You never hear Jesus complain about anything. You never see him run. You never see him have any kind of anxiety. You never hear him saying, guys, I really need you to pray for me, guys. Come around, all gather around, you know. No, no, no. 
Jesus is a remarkable man. He's a remarkable man. There is no one like him. No, there never will be anybody like him. But there is a man in heaven. There's a man in heaven. Can you believe? There is a man with a body in heaven right now. With holes in his hands and in his feet. And the fury of his father's wrath towards sin has been appeased. Haman has been lifted up. Do you understand? The Son of Man has been lifted up. The serpent has been lifted up. Sin has been judged in the sinless one. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For 4,000 years sacrifices were only a shadow. This was the point. The cross was the point when God's fury and wrath would be displayed. If I be lifted up, if I be lifted up for the demonstration I say of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be, and this is incredible, so that he would be just and the justifier, just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You understand He's both the just one and the justifier. You see, friends, this is what we see at the mercy seat. At the mercy seat, we see mercy and compassion, kissing with truth and judgment. The two come together. They kiss at the throne. The mercy and compassion and the love of God and the righteousness and the judgment and the holiness kiss. They come together. That's what happens at the cross. There's this collision of God's overflowing love and his abounding righteousness all being fulfilled in one act. Both the just and the justifier. We've been justified. We have been justified. It goes on to say, so where then is the boasting? Where then, where's the gurus? Where are the gurus of Christianity? Where are the ones that can say, I did it my way? What does it say here? Where is the boasting then? I love it. It just simply says this. It is excluded. It is excluded. There can and never will be any boasting. And we sing hymns and songs about it, and we will for the whole of eternity. I love Romans 5, 1, because for me... And I'm, I, I'm sure for you, Romans 5.1 was a reality. It was a reality in my life. There, I didn't understand it at the time because I didn't know the book of Romans. But therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I never had read the book of Romans. I didn't know about the book of Romans. But the minute I truly put my faith in Jesus... That bedroom filled with peace. I never felt such a peace. I, I knew I was at peace with God. I knew the, the second I placed my faith in him that I was going to heaven. Because I believed that what he did, he did for me. And when you've been justified by believing, by believing, you have peace with God. The opposite of that is that when that peace starts to diminish, it's because our faith in him is not where it should be. Do you understand? We've all been there. This Thursday morning, I woke up thinking about Daniel and thinking about it's God that changes the seasons and thinking, I've just got to rest in you, Lord. The peace comes straight back. That peace comes straight back. That peace. What... There's nothing. And that's the first fruit of how we know that we're saved. There's just this peace. And it's a product of what he did on our behalf. Isn't it amazing, the Bible? Absolutely incredible. Jeremiah chapter 9, we are coming to a conclusion this morning. Jeremiah chapter 9, a lovely, lovely verse in Jeremiah Chapter 9, verse 23. It says, Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. 
Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises, look very carefully, because this is the gospel, who exercises loving kindness, justice and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. That is the gospel right there. Amen. Boast in that one thing, that he is the God who exercises loving kindness and justice and righteousness in equal measures. Isn't that incredible? So there's this verse, and, and it's becoming now a, a verse that um, many of us are quite rightly, um, everybody's talking about, and it's in Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. It says this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, and bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. How many times have you heard that quoted recently? So many people are waking up to the fact that something shocking is happening. Well, here's the thing. You were evil, and you have been called good. You were dark, but you are now called light. Do you understand? You were wicked, and you are now declared as righteous. Think about this. If this verse is true, and there's a curse on everybody that calls a thing that is evil good and a thing that is good, evil, then do you understand the logic? Then what happened at the cross must be real. Because if it's not real, then we're cursed. Do you understand? Something happened. Something legal happened in heaven, whereby we were once evil, but now we're declared good. We were once wicked, but now we're declared righteous. We were once in darkness, but now we're declared in light. Otherwise, we're under a terrible curse. The cross is real. When Jesus cried out, it is finished, it truly is finished. Something has happened and now I know. I can remember the day when that peace came. I can remember the day when I... I, I, I Heard the Saviour's voice through the Bible. I don't mean an audible voice. I heard his voice for the first time in my life. I heard the voice of Jesus. And the peace, the peace. And without that, you will not make it. None of us will make it without that. Without an understanding of the gospel, of the grounding, of what he's done, of our security, of our hope, of our peace. All of the other stuff, all the traps and trimmings of Christianity, all about prophecy and history and this and that, all of it comes to nothing unless we know and we've settled it in our heart. I know I'm saved because I have put my faith in him. And I know that peace that surpasses all understanding. And it is a, it's a work that nobody can ever fully comprehend. Nobody can. It's beyond our human capacity to comprehend how God's sovereignty and human responsibility work together to, 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 to perform this thing that we call salvation. But Jesus has done it. Jesus has done it, and no man can boast. No one. Let me just one more scripture, and we're done this morning. If you want to turn to Acts chapter 10. Peter was hungry. Peter was hungry. There's all kinds of hunger isn't there? there's physical hunger there's hunger for souls there's hunger for souls and Peter was hungry and in his hunger he had a vision and he saw in this vision all of these different kinds of unclean things that Jewish people were not allowed to eat 
And then comes this voice telling Peter to get up and kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy or unclean. And again, a voice came to him a second time, what God has cleansed, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. And it goes on in this chapter to explain exactly what's been talked about here. It's the Gentiles. The Gentiles who were considered to be unclean by the Jewish people. What God has made clean. Do not call unclean. Do you understand? Woe is the person that calls evil good and good evil. But if God has cleaned somebody up, God has cleaned them up. And what God has done, he's done. He's done it. Either that or the whole gospel is a mockery. And you know in your heart, Christ bears witness to you. The peace of God inside of you. Every time you read the Bible, the Bible, the washing of the water, the word, bear witness to you. You're clean. You're clean. Christ has made a filthy sinner like me clean. And he calls me clean. How? Jesus went to the gallows. And the Haman in me, that horrible, vindictive Haman in me was crucified in him. And God's anger towards my sin was appeased in Jesus' sacrifice. The Haman in me went to the gallows. The just for the unjust. The holy for the unholy. The sinless one for the sinner. The Lord of light for the deeds of darkness. The good shepherd for the evil sheep. Christ became sin. The serpent was lifted up. Haman was hung. Jesus' sinless blood has redeemed us all. The wages of sin is death, but Jesus died. The wages of sin is death, but Jesus died in our place. Now we have the gift of God. The gift of God. Hallelujah. Sometimes, friends... We just need to be reminded of the gospel. And I just want you to be comforted. You, you belong to the beloved. And he looks after his own. He who touches you touches the apple of his eye. You belong to the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.